happy Monday, everybody. Um, appreciate you coming out today. So a couple quick things, uh, just uh, you know, obviously wrapping up the Wagner game, uh, having the opportunity to look at the uh, at the film and, and detail it up a little bit. Um, you know, I think there were some really, really positive things, obviously, if from an offensive standpoint. Uh, defensively, in the first half in particular, I think we did a really poor job of aligning for success. You know, I mean, I think that's such an underrated part of being a good defensive football player is in a pre-snap position, being able to get yourself in position to be able to execute your assignment. And I think we had some uh, some pretty serious errors in that area. Uh, and so those are going to be points of emphasis for us moving forward, getting some of that stuff squared away a little bit. Um, still with some shuffling of the deck going on at the linebacker position. Michael playing a little bit more Will linebacker this week than he had been. I think that caused some confusion for him. But uh, we'll get that stuff squared away. Um, you know, I thought we did a nice job of kind of settling down and, and just kind of going with our groove calls and our base calls in the second half and playing, a, um, would say, a better brand of defense. Um, you know, I think having guys like Jacques Allen out uh, and uh, Jalen Cole, that can cause us some matchup problems in some of our nickel packages. And so it'll be nice to hopefully get those guys back for, as we go into league play. Offensively, clearly Tucker had a nice day. Uh, really actually missed some throws early once he kind of settled down and got into the flow of the game. I thought he made much better decisions. Um, you know, I think he's, uh, he's a guy that I think is going to continue to improve. It'll be, you know, our big challenge right now is just making the right decision in terms of how we're going to utilize he and Troy. Uh, I feel strongly that Troy is, uh, you know, is one of our key leaders on the offensive side of the ball, a young man that uh, through the body of work of fall camp had the confidence of his teammates and his coaches. Uh, and uh, while well, he has a different skill set perhaps than Tucker, I think he's uh, a guy that can, can do a lot of really good things, and that's taken nothing away from what Tucker did. Uh, I think Troy will be, uh, I'm anticipating that he will be out of his cast and ready to go full this week. And uh, we're hopeful that Chad Cano is going to be full this week, and that will make a big difference for us. We've had some issues at linebacker, and I think that Chad was probably our most efficient guy through fall camp with Grant not really doing a lot. And so uh, I think those are some guys that we're excited to get back. I think uh, talk about players of the week, you know, starting with our scout team guys. We've got some young guys that are doing some really good stuff. Blake Allred, kid from Billing Senior, was recognized as a special teams player of the week on a scout team this week. Really a hard, big time effort guy, uh, total team guy, love the kid. Travis Yates. Uh, a guy that kind of got lost a little bit, uh, was kind of highly touted out of high school, ended up having a, a season-ending surgery early last year, did not participate in spring ball, was kind of set back in terms of his development, and really over the last week and a half has started to flash, and very, very pleased to see him starting to make the kind of progress and become the kind of player that we thought he was going to be, and he was recognized as our, our scout team player of the week on defense. And then Derek Snell, uh, young man from Chugiak High School, who was the Gatorade Player of the Year in Alaska last year, uh, as uh, He's a pretty good football player. And uh, he just it, it's just interesting because the game is so different for him here at, at, the, at the college Division One level versus what he was doing in Alaska. And he was kind of just a guy that they hear, here's the ball, go do something with it. And, and it took him a while, I think, to learn how to play within the system. And he did a nice job this last week in, in helping us in our preparation. He was recognized as the Offensive Scout Team Player of the Week. Um, for our internal players of the week, um, you know, Ty Okada, guy that, I mean, it's kind of funny because at the end of the game, they kind of tried to pick on him. I don't know if you guys caught on to that. You know, we got our, our you know slow white corner out there, number 19, and they went right after him, and he he deed guys up and made hits, and that's just who Ty is. He's he's a he was our our young gun, weight room warrior as a redshirt freshman last year. Highly highly competitive young man was a high school quarterback, a great wrestler in high school, and uh, was really starting to come along and make some plays for us on special teams, and he was recognized for that this week. Tyrone Fontenono on defense. I mean, when that guy brings it, he's going to be hard for really anybody in this league to block. And you know, that's one of the challenges that I always present to him is, can you do this every down? And uh, you know, our defensive line rose up. There was a, a couple series in the second half where they just said, "Hey, we're done with this. Let's put this thing away." And uh, you know, I was going through the film and I was just really impressed with the way that he continues to play at a high level. So he was our defensive player of the, of the week. And you know, you look at it on offense and you go, okay, you probably make a case for Kevin Cassis, 126 yards, nine receptions, a couple touchdowns. Certainly can make a case for Tucker Rovick, uh, high percentage of completions, three touchdowns, no interceptions, over 300 yards passing. But I thought the young man that really set the tone for our day, uh, and not just with his production, but with how he produced in a physical manner, was Isaiah Infonse. I thought he was extremely impressive. Um, just how he how he finished runs, the energy that he brought, and the productivity that he had throughout the day. And so he was our our, uh, our offensive player of the week. And uh, 
kind of turning on turning the page now. Now it's time to crank things up a little bit. The intensity level rises. The level of preparation needs to increase as we go into Big Sky Conference play, and we've got a uh, you know really interesting opponent. I mean, I think Portland State is as talented as anybody we play. I mean, they have guys. You know, they've got a couple of guys that we were recruiting at the University of Washington. They're playing for them that are Pac-12 level talents on the offensive side of the ball. Defensively, they've got a couple guys that can really get after the passer. They're very, very difficult to prepare for on offense because their defense is interesting. Um, it's kind of a hybrid flex. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very unique style that they play. They create a lot of negative plays because there's a lot of confusion that comes with it. It's not a hard defense to ID up front, or it's not an easy one, rather. And they mix the coverages, and so they've got they've, it, it's a problem. They create a lot of negative plays. And then on offense, um, they're kind of a two-headed monster. I think they want to go with number six as their starting quarterback. He seems to be the primary guy. He's maybe a little bit better passer. Uh, but you know, the Eason kid, number 10, is a really good athlete. You're going to have to be able to defend some quarterback runs, some, some option game when he's in there. And then you've got their pistol run game and kind of their DNA offense and a lot of empty um, with, uh, with what they've got there. So they've got some really good weapons in the skill positions, some solid running backs, some great receivers, and a tight end that's a real problem in number 89 in terms of matchups. And uh, defensively, like I said, it's a real big challenge. So I think it's going to be an interesting deal. It's going to be a kind of a bring your own energy game. You know, we're going to Hillsboro to uh, the, the um, I don't know if it's really a high school field. I don't know exactly what it is. I've never been there. Uh, I know that just looking at it on on tape, it looks like a fairly sterile environment. And so, you know, we've got to we've got to have our energy level where it needs to be to go play at a high level. And uh, it'll be a it'll be a very good test. So, with that, I'll take any questions. I think there's a couple of positions in football that um, you can get a lot of productivity out of it early in a career. And uh, you look at like the offensive and defensive lines, those are developmental positions. A lot of times kids don't come in at, you know, six foot four, 310 pounds. You, you know, you got to kind of develop them through the time that they're here. But I think corner is a position where you can see a lot of true freshman play, um, wide receiver and tailback. I think those three positions in particular are ones where you can see freshmen play. And you can see over the last couple of years, we've had freshmen contribute in each one of those in each one of those areas. Running back is a very instinctual position. And so, um, you know, once they have the ball in their hand, you can, you can tell them where it's designed to go, but you've got to kind of let them rely on, on their God-given abilities. What does Isaiah bring to the pass catcher? He's got good hands. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed with just how he's assimilated into the offense. You know, it's a lot of stuff to throw at a kid like that. And um, he's very detailed, uh, very competitive kid. Um, you know, I know you guys don't get the opportunity to talk to freshmen, and, and that's by design. We want these young men to be able to focus on school and football, and, and throwing media in there can be another little pitfall for them. But uh, when you do get the opportunity to engage with this young man, I think you're going to be just really, really impressed with the type of person he is as well. On Saturday, you had said that Tucker did not have a good spring. Can you just kind of expand on that? Well, you know, we it wasn't. You know, we kind of had the crystal ball out. We knew that there was some things on the on the horizon that Chris could you know, kind of end up not being around. And so, you know, we wanted to find out if Tucker was going to be the answer for us. And we gave him really most of the one reps the second half of spring ball um, and really tried to force the issue with him in terms of, hey, can you take that next step? And he just did not consistently produce at a level that we felt like that was going to be, you know, the guy that could step in if this went south. And so that led to our decision, obviously, to you know, have what like, Travis was already here, but we didn't know what he was capable of. And that was kind of one of the things that led us to the decision to make the transition with Troy over the summer. And so um, you know, to Tucker's credit, he came with a renewed sense of, of urgency and, and commitment uh, into fall camp. And he really did that last six, eight practices of fall camp. I mean, I felt like he was as good as we had. And uh, you know, he got all the reps last week with the ones, and I think that helped him. And I think he's a guy that's going to prepare the right way, and he's going to put his, his teammates in the best position to be able to be successful. Talk about alignment issues being an issue at South Dakota State as well as in the first half against Wagner. What is going into that? Well, I, I think I think a, I think a lot of it is just you know playing a lot of linebackers that haven't played a lot of football, and that's you know really the primary position where we're having the issues. And, um, you know, while Michael played a bunch of football for us last year, it was on the edge, and being in the middle of the defense is a much different animal. You don't have, or you haven't had Grant and Josh, who were kind of the stabilizing factors for us in there. And without Chad, who was the other guy that I think had mastered some of that stuff, um, we were kind of, you know, 
a little bit shooting in the dark, and it was not good. I mean, it wasn't. And so, um, you know, those are things that, you know, whether it's getting guys back like Chad, you know, getting Grant back in the fold, that's going to be part of it. But part of it is also going to be these young guys taking responsibility for knowing their, their alignment and their assignment and then playing fast. And, uh, you know, that's the challenge that we issued to them yesterday, and, and I fully expect that they'll step up to the plate. Yeah, I, it's, I don't know, it's kind of a double-edged sword because, you know, you want to have that. I think that the flow of the offense is so much better when you just got one guy that's running the show. And, uh, and I think that's something that you got to be pay attention to. And that doesn't mean that you can't be successful in, in utilizing multiple quarterbacks in different situations. But I think that what we need to have is we need to have that one guy that's, you know, consistently over the course of the game, we know what we're going to get from them. We can, you know, make our adjustments and our calls as the game goes on based on what they do well and, and how uh, they can best attack the defenses. And so, um, you know, I, I feel much better. I mean, here's, here's, the, here's the issue, right? Okay, so um, I think we've made a decision that, that, you know, Travis is going to help our program and himself in the long run more as a receiver. I think we've got two young quarterbacks that are developmental and probably aren't quite ready to go out and, and win a game for you. And so that means you got Tucker and Troy. I like Tucker and Troy. That's pretty good. But, uh, you know, each one's one play away from being really the only quarterback option for us, and besides some of those two fr true freshmen that have got to prepare like they're going to play. And uh, each week have got to have a sense of urgency about how they go about their business. And so, um, you know, I think if, if, we, if we need to use two quarterbacks, we'll use two quarterbacks. But we'd prefer to be a team that has one guy leading the show. And you saw that, you know, in the, the two games where we really had one guy that was, you know, in command, I think we played pretty well, uh, specifically in the second half against Western Illinois and then throughout the game against, uh, against Wagner. What, what did you see on the kickoff return, uh, the opening kickoff that went for a touchdown? Well, I saw about five guys not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, like I told them yesterday, it's impossible to cover a kickoff with both hands around your neck. It cannot be done. And so you've got to know what you're going to do. You've got to make full speed decisions. You've got to play fast. And uh, there was, you know, there's some nuances of the game that I can get into or probably bore the heck out of you. But I mean, essentially, it's just like defense. You know, you've got gaps to fit. And if you don't fit the gap or you've got two guys in a gap, there's going to be a seam. And that's what happened. And then just following up, you know, it looks like Portland State has blocked a few kicks this year. So um, how dialed in do you think special teams will have to be in particular this week? I think, you know, I think Nick Whitworth's the guy that's been in this league a long time, was a great player at Idaho State, and uh, has been a special teams guy for, I think, forever. You know, used to come over and clinic with me a lot when I was at Boise, and he's a kid from Mackey who I actually coached against, believe it or not, when I was the head coach in Chalice, and he was the Mackey missile. And uh, so, you know, I've known, I've known him for a long time. I actually married one of my former students from Chalice, so, you know. There's a lot of connections there, and I know Nick's a good coach, and he's a takes a lot of pride in his preparation in that phase. And so, you know, I think we've been, um, you know, I thought Jared did a nice job of controlling field position for us in the punt game on Saturday, and I think that's kind of you know his his responsibility is to do that for us. And we've been much more explosive on punt and kickoff return this year early in the season than we were last year, and so um, we've created some advantages for ourselves in that area, but we have given up some explosives, and uh, you know had a couple. That got out on us against uh, Western Illinois in the opener, you know, not for touchdowns, but then you get this one, and that opens a heightened sense of urgency. And here's the thing about kickoff coverage: having done this a long time, you know, like I told BJ, here's the deal, okay? You know, usually it's bad kick, bad coverage, good kick, good coverage. Meaning that if the hang and placement are appropriate, you should be able to cover it. That's not our problem right now. Our problem's personnel, and it's going to be easy because there's no more favors being passed out around here. We're going down to 60 on the travel roster. And that means that if our starting linebacker and our starting tailback have to cover kicks, that's what they're going to do. Because what will get you beat in special teams is not how you return the ball. It's how you cover the kick. And so we've got to have our best guys ready to go on kickoff and punt, and we will. I know you've played, there's been some big matchups with the Saunders kid, Christensen, Fulce. How do matchups like this in the non-conference prepare you? For well, I think, it, I think it punches holes in some of our game plan. You know, I think we, we've got to do a better job of taking away the other team's best player. You know, not just calling defenses because that's what we do, but taking away what they do best. And I think that's something that moving forward, you know, you've got a, you've got some teams that are going to have more than one threat, certainly. Um, but uh, and I think this is one of them. 
And so, you, you know, but, you know, in that particular situation, all we had to do was stop number three and we were going to win the game. And when we decided we were going to do that, things went pretty good for us on defense. And so um, recognizing the talent and skill of the individual, don't, don't underestimate those, those guys. If they show up on tape as consistently excellent players, they're probably excellent players. And we've got to have a good plan in place to take care of that. Do you think that linebacker depth is you know, kind of finally being replenished now? You know, now that guys are coming back? Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of knew that a little bit. You know, our plan with Grant was to ease him into everything. Um, you know, Chad was not something that we anticipated. And we didn't think it was going to be this long, really. And so, um, you know, that was one that maybe was a little bit rough. But we felt like, you know, some of the young guys had done some decent things through the course of fall camp. But they're seeing the same offense every day. And so when things change quickly and the implant that you have to implement the game plan over a two or three day period instead of having two or three weeks to figure things out, um, young guys have got to adjust to that. And, and uh, that's that's the preparation thing that I'm talking about is, you know, you can't just have it spoon fed to you in the meetings. You've got to be able to do some homework on your own, too. Well, I think South Dakota State was kind of an interesting deal. I mean, you're going into a tough road environment against a very good football team, and really nothing went well um, from from the jump. I mean, there was there was kind of Murphy's Law, and you know, you, you kind of you get stunned a little bit, and it takes you a while to kind of get your bearings back. And I think that was part of it. I mean, I think it was a little bit being wide-eyed. Um, you know, we we didn't have anything real positive going in any one of the phases, and so um, start to press a little bit things don't go right, you start to press a little bit more. And so I think going into this week is just kind of, we, we spent a lot of time talking about just how, to ha how do we have success post-snap? Well, it starts with getting the call, making sure everybody's on the same page, having good tempo up to the line of scrimmage, communicating with one another, uh, identifying what we're getting in terms of the front and coverage. Let's not skip steps and just go out there and, and go willy-nilly. Let's, let's dial in and, and make sure that we're, we're going through the progressions. And I mean, there was one play that he, he, we have a route called Klein that's a pretty standard route uh, throughout football. And he went through his progression. He actually got to his third read and hit Kevin on the curl to the field side. And I was like, that's pretty good. That's what we're talking about here. You know, He knew where he was going with that. He was comfortable. We had great protection. And, uh, and I think that was the difference. And I think a lot of it is you know, we, we, that, that South Dakota thing was weird because we were trying to see if maybe we could get some QB run game out of, out of Travis. And I think that took away from some of the preparation for Tucker. And I think that was my fault. You know, you're trying to put your team in the best situation to win. Well, sometimes less is more. And I think that that was our, uh, one of the approaches that we took was let's strip this down a little bit. Let's let this kid sink in and see if he can master a game plan. And I thought he did a pretty good job. I think their I think their athleticism is a problem. I think they they're really they have really good team speed, a lot of talented skilled players as I mentioned, and I think just the unique nature of what they do on defense is a big problem. It it, it creates a lot of issues because, you know, you you're looking for commonalities, right? You're looking for okay, if this, then this, and there's not a lot of that out there. I mean, there's a it's a pretty unique style that they play, and then um, you you have to be able to, and then on the other side you have to be able to defend a couple of different styles because. When number 10's in the game, you know, he's a, he's a definite QB run threat. You're going to have to defend some option. And then they'll get into empty and spread it out and throw the ball a bunch. And so, um, you know, you're almost preparing a little bit two different game plans on defense. Are you guys preparing differently because now it's conference play compared to the last three? I don't think you prepare any differently. I hope that you prepare with more urgency. I think that, it, you know, every, I mean, you know, it's like I tell our guys, I mean, you got to prepare like you're playing for the conference championship on Saturday because you are. You know, because you are. You have to, every single week is in this league, it's, it's a crazy league, but it's a fun league because every single week you start looking at the scores and you go, how about that? Can you believe that happened? Can you believe this happened? Can you believe that happened? So if you don't bring it and you don't prepare correctly, you know, you're, you're going to get beat. Having said that, I mean, you know, this league has been hard to forecast the last few years for whatever reason. So it's because there's 13 teams, Greg. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that not a story? <laughs> Help us out here. <laughs> so, I mean, do you, you anticipate the race being kind of like that again this year? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, it's funny because, okay, Case Cookus goes down in NAU. 
early on, that looks like that's going to be a team that's going to be one of the favorites in the conference. And all of a sudden, one guy's down, and that changes a lot for them. Uh, you know, and I think that was a non-conference game that Eastern beat them in, but it still has an impact. And so, you know, you, you start to see now, I mean, this is the week where you're going to start to find out what's going on. I think Cal Poly's a lot better. I really do. Um, you know, I think Weber on defense is still really, really good. And, uh, you know, you start to look at it, and you, you just don't know. I mean, you just um, – we, we don't even see a lot of these teams. So, you know, I don't know how, how you can it's, – it's like you're guessing a lot of times because just, you know, where you play, that has an impact. Playing at Southern Utah, playing at Northern Colorado, those are tough trips. You know, playing at NAU, I mean, those are – there's a lot of those things that come into it that are just really difficult to, to kind of equate. And so it comes down to what you do on the field, and that starts with how you prepare. I know Barnes back calling plays at Portland State. Does it look different than it did a year ago with him back in there? I, I think he called plays against us last year. Yeah, I think that they had kind of transitioned a little bit. I, you know, just watching the game, to me, right. Bruce was clearly making the calls. And so, um, you know, I don't know. It's, it, I think that they're just kind of in a mode right now where um, there's, they're, they're stuck in between. They, I think they like the ability to spread the field and throw the ball, and they feel like Six does a pretty good job of that. And they've got some really good weapons on the – it's 88 – 80. The kid from uh, from Washington. I mean, good God, Emmanuel. We were we recruited him at Washington. I mean, he's he's looks like those mannequins up in the office up there. And an '89 is a freak show, and so he's got these toys. You know, he's got to figure out how to maximize those guys as playmakers because they are really really good. And they made explosive plays against everybody. I mean, not just College of Idaho, but against Oregon and against Nevada. And um, so I think that's part of it is how does he get the ball to those guys and still be able to kind of stick to his roots and his pistol run game. Pass rush. Yeah, I mean, clearly, we hit the quarterback 15 times the other day. We only sacked him twice, but we, we hit that quarterback a lot. And at the end of the game, he was not accurate. And those balls were not anywhere near his receivers. And so uh, that's where it starts and stops. Pressure over coverage, it always wins. Is that, you, is that something you can tell as the game's going on? That that I, just, I just notice how many times he's on the ground at the end of the play. Even if he makes a good throw, steps into the pocket and completes a pass, if he's on his back at the end of it, that's going to add up. And so, yeah, I mean, like I said, in the you know midway through the third quarter, our our D line just took over, and that was it. I'm curious what your what do you think your dream scenario is for the Big Sky, or you, know, you kind of mentioned the, the issues that you have with it. You know, what, what would be yeah, I probably won't get into my dream scenario. <laughs> I just think we've got to examine what we're doing. I think, I think we've got to have some honest conversations, and not about feelings, but about what's best for the league as a whole, uh, specifically football. And I think a lot of the decisions were maybe made to try to you know, perhaps get another basketball guy and, and, and another basketball team in the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, do what you got to do in basketball, but let's not mess football up in the process. And so I think that's the, you know, I think the athletic directors, the presidents, uh, have got to listen to the football coaches, and this is not personal. This is about what's best for the league as a whole, and I think that there's some things that we need to look at to make it best for our league as a whole. If you've been told you know, you'd be two and one in non-con uh, before it started, would you, would you have taken that? Well, I want to be three and zero oh, clearly, but I mean, here's the deal: I knew that Western game was a huge game. I told our guys that back in June when we sat down as a staff. I said, "This is a big, big game." Because there's the potential if you drop that one to be 0-2 going into the Wagner game. Well, now you're 1-2 going into conference play instead of 2-1. And, and that's a big difference. That's a big difference. You know, against an all-FBS or F Division I schedule, that's a big difference. If we're playing two, you know, Division II schools or an NAI school and a Division II school, you know, what does that really tell you? I don't know. But I know we beat, I think, a Western Illinois team that's a pretty good team. You know, and we had to gut it out and got it done. And I think being at home was, was certainly impactful in that. But I think we made the plays that we needed to make in that game to win it. And then we did not play well against a really good team. I don't think that's who we are. Um, but we don't get do-overs in this business. So we got to own it, accept it, learn from it, and move on. And then I think, it, I think Wagner's a pretty good NEC team. I think they've got some good talent. I don't think that's a, a bad football team by any stretch of the imagination. And so now we'll find out what, what, what has that in, Good non-conference schedule allowed us to gauge where we're at. I think Portland State's kind of in a different position because they probably played two games against teams that are, you know, feel bad for Bruce that he's got to go do that. But, you know, I mean, you open up against Nevada and, and Oregon, okay, well, kind of what's supposed to happen happens. And then you play College of Idaho, you know, a frontier conference team, and you kind of do to them what you're supposed to do. So um, I think they're probably telling their guys, hey, listen, we're 0-0. Zero zero. Big Sky Conference play begins now. Let's get things right and go. Two wins at home, but a loss on the road, and now you guys are about to go on the road again. 
Well, I mean, I think obviously, you know, getting a home win and the way that we did it uh, was certainly important for our group after what had happened at South Dakota. And so um, I think we're in a good place mentally and, you know, we've got to, you know, do a better job of getting these guys dialed and ready to go on the road, and we will. Curtis Amos looked like he popped the question on. Yeah, Saturday. he probably should have asked me before he did that. That was. <laughs> He and I had a little chat about that. I said, congratulations, don't ever do it again. Well, <laughs> that probably won't happen, so. What kind of a, uh, I mean, you know, he's a guy who's stuck around through the, yeah. the coaching change, the culture change. He looks like he's become a valuable guy, especially in a blocking role. Um, can you talk about just his journey? And how yeah, he's... you know, I mean, I think, I, you know, he came here as a defensive lineman, if I remember correctly from what he maybe had told me, you know, if we needed somebody to rush the passer, he was ready to go. I played some special teams and, and that type of thing. And, um, he's from a really good family. You know, I think his parents were probably a big pre reason why, you know, they said, hey, you're in a good spot, get your degree, stick it out. And I think a lot of times when kids have doubt about whether they're going to hang through a coaching change or things don't go their way, what they really need is their parents to look at it and go, hey, are you happy, safe, and productive where you're at? Then have the courage to see it through. And so I really respect Curtis for being that man and uh, embracing his role on this team, which we challenged him, you know, about two years ago, you got to be a more physical player. Or you're, you know, not going to have a lot of role in this, and and he has really embraced that, and he's become a very physical blocker for us, and an exceptionally important part of our run game, and uh, you know, a really good leader in the locker room. Follow up question, Greg. Follow well, up. no, I was just going to ask if you saw the. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, ninety. They hung on him. Um, yeah, those guys are good. Offensive line seemed to have improved so much in the Wagner game from the first two games. What was the biggest step? And, and I, I think it was on us to put them in position to be successful. Let's roll off the ball. Let's be committed to doing you know our DNA stuff. I mean, that's what I kind of told the offensive staff. I, said, Look, I built a cut up of here's who we are. All right, let's watch the first two games. I mean, we're, we're losing our DNA here. You know, Let's get back to being who we are. And I think once we did that, I think our old line <laughs> loved it. I think they like rolling off the ball. and. And uh, then, you know, it opens up so many other things for your offense. I know Dante Scirocco carried out the hammer. There was a big play he had where he spilled the fullback and, and tackled Bulls on the goal line. Is he starting to make the steps? And he is. You, you know, he had a big hit on the quarterback on a third down, down in the, in the blockhouse end. Um, he, you know, he's starting to play faster. And I think that's the biggest thing. You know, you, you, you know, even though he was a really good high school football player and played as a true freshman at the University of Colorado, it's a different system. You know, and, and so to learn how to acclimate to the locker room, to get to know your teammates, to figure out the defense, to know how coach, you know, to, to know how coach Hout works and operates and all those things. And so you're starting to see him flash. And I think he's just going to continue to get back. And we're going to need him. I mean, he's going to continue to, I think, get more downs. And, um, and, and I think, you know, by the end of the year, I think he's going to be a guy that has had a really positive impact for our team. Good? Thanks. Thanks.